welcome to today's webinar from the British Neuroscience Association. I know from um, the registrations um, that we have a whole range of different people from different backgrounds and different countries, which is fantastic. I'd uh, just like to point out that obviously we don't know all of your individual circumstances, specific circumstances. So although we'll try and be, you know, hopefully you'll get some really useful information out of today's webinar, but we can't give specific advice. And I would say, you know, go and talk to people who really know your circumstances and your own particular situation before making any decisions. So we are gonna start off with a quick poll. Um, this is just to get an idea of who is actually joining us today. So I'm going to launch the polling and hopefully you will see that on your screen. So if you could just select there whether you are a pre-university or school student, undergraduate student, postgraduate, postdoc, a parent, friend, carer or teacher and any of the above or some other position. I'm just going to leave that on the screen uh, and then hang out, hand over to my colleague Emma Supramanian. Um, she's not going to say this, so I am. I'm just going to say Emma has just finished her undergraduate degree in neuroscience and has just got a first. So huge congratulations to Emma. Um, Emma, if you'd like to take over from here. Thank you very much for both the housekeeping and for feeding my ego. <laughs> a very good morning to you all, or evening or afternoon, wherever you are in the world today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you've had a wonderful day thus far. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to the Careers in Neuroscience and Beyond webinar. So like Anne has introduced, I am Emma Supermanian from the British Neuroscience Association, Student and Early Career Research Representative, and I shall be your host for today. So this webinar, those who are unsure about A-level choices, those who question whether a master's is worth their while, those who don't know what to do with a PhD, or even those who don't resonate with academia at all and want to see where their qualification can take them, this webinar is for each and every one of you all to find out what is out there and ask any question you like. So today we'll be hearing from our wonderful speakers, Dr. Anne Cook and Professor Anthony Isles, who will chat about their career progression, as well as about the wide range of career options available to you after studying neuroscience. Each talk will be about 10 minutes long, after which we'll have a Q&A session. But if you have any questions directed to any of the speakers, we'll see if we can attack some of them after their talks. So before we get started, let's have a look at some of the poll results. Let us see, we have a very good range and we have many undergrads and postgrads. So I hope that these talks will be very useful to you all. We have some postdocs and some parents. Wonderful to see you all. And Anne has also said, and I'll remind you that this event will be recorded and available to view on the BNA's YouTube channel. And I will post a link to the YouTube channel in the chat box shortly. So there will be the chance to submit questions as well, Anne has mentioned. So first of all, we will be hearing from Professor Anthony Isles, BNA trustee, based at Cardiff University, where he researches epigenetic mechanisms of brain and behavior and how they contribute to neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders. As well as this, he teaches undergraduate and postgraduate students and I do not know how he has the time. <laughs> he will talk about how he came to be a neuroscience researcher and ways into neuroscience. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Anthony Miles. Okay, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. I'm just gonna uh, share my screen now and... Great. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, so I'm going to be giving um, a little overview of an academic career in neuroscience and specifically mainly focusing on my own career. So I'm going to give an example of the academic career path and with reference to me. But then I'm also going to spend a little bit of time talking about the pathways to PhDs, the kind of undergraduate, what you need to do at undergraduate level, what a PhD involves a little bit and then what it can lead to. Um, and then I'll just finish with some thoughts and suggestions. So this is me in about 1980. And I was about eight years old, seven years old. And I don't think at that time I particularly thought about becoming a neuroscientist. I don't think I ever had any ambitions to be a neuroscientist at this point. I was quite interested in biology. So Around this age, I think I wanted to be David Attenborough. Um, and then a little bit later on, I had a slightly more realistic um, career idea, which was to 
become a surgeon in the Royal Navy. My grandfather had been in the Royal Navy and I thought that I could maybe become a surgeon and um, also the Royal Navy would pay for your medicine degree. So that was kind of thoughts I'd had of, around, in my childhood in terms of careers. So how did I go from um, this to becoming professor of uh, molecular and behavioral neuroscience at Cardiff? Well, this is my um, career path and it's probably a very, bog standard good example of an academic career path at least on the surface and we'll come we'll come to that in a little bit so I did my A levels I did biology chemistry physics and we also at the time used to do this um, an A level called general studies and then I went on to do an undergraduate degree and that actually was in zoology and genetics and that was at Sheffield University then I worked for a year as a European science funded technician in the genetics department of the Leicester University. And that was a quite an exciting time because Leicester University had a very prominent genetics department that was working on um, DNA fingerprinting and other things like that. And then I undertook a PhD and that was at Cambridge University in the sub department of animal behavior. And this PhD was then followed by two postdoctoral positions, one of three years and one of two years. And this was held at the Babram Institute, which is a research institute just outside Cambridge. And then from there, I progressed to my own personal fellowship, became more independent. And this was called the Beeb Trust Research Fellow. And this was held between the Babram Institute and also the Department of Psychiatry in the University of Cambridge. And it was a five year long position. Then I became, um, I could take that fellowship partway through, about three years through, I became a lecturer at Cardiff University and the fellowship continued for the next two years. And from there I progressed through the, the various academic ranks at the university to become a professor of molecular and behavioral neuroscience in about 2016. So that, as I said, on the surface is a very st standard, straightforward academic career path, uh, going from undergraduate degree, doing a PhD, doing some postdocs, obtaining a fellowship, personal fellowship, and then obtaining a, a, a tenured position at a university. But actually, underneath, it's not quite the same. And I've shamelessly stolen this slide, uh, or a version of this slide from Anne, who's going to talk next. But my A-levels, I actually failed to get into medicine. I was originally planning to apply for medicine. I had a few interviews and I had a couple of offers, one from Sheffield, but I didn't get the A-level grades I requ required. And so I ended up going through what's known in the UK as clearing, which is the kind of last minute scramble for university places for people who failed their A-levels. And I knew I wanted to do something biological so I, and possibly zoology. So I phoned up the University of Sheffield and to see if I could get onto their zoology degree. They didn't have any spaces, but they did have a space on their dual honours zoology and genetics. I didn't really want to do genetics. I didn't find it. I didn't think I found it that interesting at the time, but it was all they had. So I thought, well, I'll go for it and we'll see what happens. So I actually really enjoyed doing uh, the degree and I enjoyed the genetics component and I stuck with it throughout the whole degree. And it was about in year two that I, I, I realized that actually you could do research in science as a career. And there was, we had some really good lecturers who really inspired me to be interested in, in at the time, in behavioral ecology and in behavioral um, biology. And so I did have the plan at the end of my degree to do a PhD and become an academic researcher. But actually, I failed to get any um, PhD offers or even any interviews when I applied from, my, from the final year of my degree. I eventually got a 2-1. And uh, I had a two one and in, the, and in the summer, I remember panicking, thinking, what am I going to do? And applied for absolutely anything that was going um, all sorts of jobs, all sorts of different biologically related, but and varied amounts of different kind of career options. I just applied blanket, sent my CV out everywhere. And there was very little going at the time. I think, I think there was probably a bit of a recession at that time. But I did get a nibble from this uh, individual who worked in Leicester and they said, well, we've got this, this ESF funded technician place, which is like a kind of like a student position. Would you like to come and work for a year? And so I took that, but it, I was absolutely miserable in, in Leicester. It was, I was not very well paid, but not really a student. 
so it was kind of personally quite difficult but actually looking back it was probably one of the one of the key things that allowed me to become an academic researcher because I spent a large amount of time working in the lab working on learning molecular biology techniques learning about genetics from the geneticists in the University of Leicester doing things that I'd kind of started doing as an undergraduate in my undergraduate project but never really got chance to fully get to grips with and now I wasn't you know I could say that I could do molecular biology techniques and I think on the back of that I was offered lots and lots of PhD places I had lots of PhD interviews and I chose to do a PhD at the sub-department of animal behavior in Cambridge now Cambridge obviously is a very uh, prominent university but I actually wasn't that keen on going and I think I was not really interested in the research of the supervisor who'd asked me to come for an interview and yet I still went I went along for the interview and when I spoke to him about the project it emerged that there was this new project he was developing that was really really exciting so I think the lesson from that is to, to you know to not just dismiss things out of hand and to maybe go and meet people and talk to as many people as possible and so I started at the University of Cambridge and it was a very happy PhD. I really enjoyed it. It was, a, it, was it was a lovely place to do a PhD. But if I'm truly honest, out of the three years that were funded, only one year of this PhD was, was what you could call truly productive. There was two years spent optimizing things, banging my head against the wall, not getting things to work. And it was only those that, that, that kind of the one year in total of getting stuff that was productive that produced my PhD. So whilst I really enjoyed it, it was really, really tough. And I think that is something that I'll come back to towards the end of the talk about how tough a PhD can be sometimes. And it's really important to consider it very carefully. But on the back of that, then I um, managed to get my postdoc positions. But actually, at the time, PhDs were funded for three years, and then you're expected to write up for a year. And so I was, before I started my postdoc positions, I was unemployed for nine months and living off living off my now wife um or she supported me whilst i was writing my phd thesis nine months is quite a long time and it was the, the only reason i i really ended up getting the postdoctoral position at the um Babem institute where I, I i would say that that's where i became a, a proper a neuroscientist working in a proper neuroscience lab was because i happened to be writing my phd in the lab at the time I was unemployed I was in the office writing at my PhD and my future employer walked through the office to go and speak to my current supervisor and said oh Anthony what, what are you doing I said I'm writing up and he said oh right okay or oh, would you be interested in a position and so I think the kind of take home from that is to you know network and speak to people as much as possible because you never know when there might be an opportunity to work with somebody or to work for them so then after that I, as I said, I carried on with postdoc positions at the Bem Institute and the fellowship. And I would say that in my career, I think the postdoc positions were probably the, the happiest period of my research life. Um, I'm not, not that I'm not happy now, but I think in terms of being able to just purely focus on doing research, the postdoc position, after you've finished your PhD, you don't have the burden of the PhD th thesis, you can just do um, research that's on the grant or on the on the position and if you're in a well-funded lab which I was luckily luckily enough to be in you can also do additional things and and we we had it was like being a, a child in a in a sweet shop it was great fun and I really enjoyed that and as you move more senior you get a fellowship there becomes a little bit more responsibility and they kind of there's a little bit of uh, that that kind of gloss is lost slightly but I mean I've enjoyed being um doing my research career from you know the fellowship onto the senior lecturer and and now as a professor but i wouldn't say that it's always um smooth going i would say that throughout my career at cardiff university and i, I started in cardiff in 2016 i've often had the feeling of imposter syndrome which is where you think well you're not quite good enough or for the position you're in i've often also thought about should i move somewhere else in terms of academic research am i confining myself am i not reaching my potential and also at times i thought should i just do something completely different and i think these kinds of um thoughts are completely normal i think everybody if they're truly honest would 
you know, despite how senior they appear, they would they would have those feelings. So, what what do the what are the kind of things I do now as, as a professor? And um, so I've broken them down into research related and teaching, and then other stuff, which is often quite important. In fact, so the research related, I don't really go in the lab much anymore. I do occasionally. Um, mess up my students experiments by going in the lab and trying to help them and they normally send me away but what I mainly do in terms of research is write grants, help um, individuals to write papers, I supervise PhD students and so help them develop their kind of scientific thinking, I give talks and presentations to the academic community and elsewhere and so that's the, what's really the focus of my of my research related but in addition of course as a member of the university you're, which is an educational institute, you're, you're obliged to be doing teaching and a large portion of, of my time is, is involved in teaching. So I do lecturing, I lecture in psychology. I also do personal tutoring. So I've got a number of personal tutors who are medics. I also supervise undergraduate and um, kind of postgraduate projects, so like MSc projects. And of course, as a consequence of the lecturing and teaching, you also have to do the marking and things like that and sit on exam boards. So the other stuff I do, which actually takes up quite a lot of time and is quite important, is some of it is related to uh, research. Some of it could be regarded as related to teaching, but I, I kind of lump it all as, as other stuff. And that's things like working for journals, which, you know, editing and reviewing articles other, I've written by other academics. Um, I also run stuff for the university. So I've put that, that's very glib, but it's kind of management responsibilities within the department. And I'll come back to, to that in a little bit. And of course, another thing I do is, is I'm a trustee for the BNA, um, and that's quite an important job as well. And these are all things that are kind of related to your research, but not directly related to your research or related to your teaching, but not necessarily your actual teaching. And they're all things that help make universities run, help make the academic environment run. And things I enjoy most about my job really a lot of them relate to the the research and i think it's the thinking about and planning experiments as i said i don't spend much time in the lab anymore but i do get to talk to some brilliant young or earlier career researchers who are, are doing the experiments and we get to think about how to do them and planning them and, and i find that that they're probably the most enjoyable thing um academic freedom so the ability to work on what i like um I asterisk that because of course it all depends on your ability to get funding so whilst there is this notion that you could be when you're an academic you can work on effectively whatever you like of course if you're doing science experiments they are quite expensive and you need to get funding for that so it's not quite as free as you would like it obviously depends on what the research funding agencies charities are willing to fund but essentially i can direct my research in any direction that i that i wish I also enjoy seeing students that I have mentored or supervised, particularly my PhD students, go on to further success um, elsewhere. And I, I do enjoy that, you know, meeting up with them later on and seeing what they're doing and talking to them about what they're doing now. And I enjoy attending meetings um, with colleagues, including uh, BNA meetings. Things I don't enjoy so much, uh, it kind of almost mirrors some of the things I do enjoy so much, which is, constantly looking for funding opportunities so there's a, a constant you know need to get funding into the lab to um to to support individuals and to progress the research and so you know, you know as soon as you've got a grant you have this uh, about five minutes of joy when you hear you get the email saying you've got a grant to do the work and then you realize you have to start looking for the next lot of funding to fund the person after the end of that grant so that can be quite uh, draining at times and relatedly is the ratio of success and failure. I think as a, an academic researcher, you have to be quite resilient because the ratio of success to failure is, is skewed towards failure. And this is in terms of getting things published, accepted as published articles, or um, get grant success. You're more likely to happy fail in these things than you are to succeed so you have to enjoy the successes when you get them and you have to be quite resilient i think the the success rate on average for grants in the uk is one in every five application is successful so it's a lot of work for uh, and for quite a bit of pain sometimes 
The other thing is, and, and I don't want to kind of oversell this, but the pay isn't the best, to be quite honest. As an academic in the UK, um, I would say that whilst I, I, I feel that I am well paid, I think many of my friends and colleagues who've gone into other industries are and, and do equivalent amounts of work or and have equivalent amounts of responsibility are, are probably considerably better paid than I am. Certainly as I, when I became a professor, I would say that my pay was probably equivalent to some of my colleagues and friends when, when they were in their early 30s and I was in my early 40s at the time. So it, it's not, it's, it's, it's depends on how you, um, how you set up your life and if whether it's the money is the main thing. And if it is, then obviously I wouldn't go into an academic career necessarily. Um, but it, it's not to say that it's not a good, well-paid job. It's just that it's not probably the best and, and you have to be, bear that in mind. And also some people often have a perception that you are well paid or indeed that you do it, you don't have to be well paid because you do it for you because you love it, which is true, but either way. The other thing is often seeing good people leave science. So, you know, we often spend, it's quite an intense relationship when you're supervising a PhD student and they're, they're all my students as that I've had have, have all been brilliant in their different ways. And and yet they all make decisions that they might not actually stay in academic research. And this is something I'll come back to in the next slide. And, and to see them leave science, it it's, can be a little bit disheartening sometimes. And like many people, is the idea of never leaving the office is also something that I don't enjoy so much, constantly thinking about uh, different things. Sometimes it's good though, because sometimes you're thinking you come up with an experiment in the middle of the night. So I just want to briefly touch upon this aspect of my job, which is run stuff for the university. And I do many other little jobs within the university, but one thing I've got a lot of experience in for the last 10, 12 years is running um, PhD programs. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the kind of um, requirements for a PhD and what a PhD can lead to um, from my experience of both supervising students and also as running um, what we call doctoral training programs, but given the kind of demographic of, of the attendees today. So as I'm sure you're, you're all aware, a PhD is a, an additional degree and specifically it's a research degree. There are, there's a, it's changed and I'll talk a little bit about this one in a minute, but it's changed, but essentially at the heart of a PhD is a research project. And so in order to be able to get onto a PhD position, you obviously have to show an interest in research. And I think this really does start at undergraduate level and it could possibly start earlier. Um, but the, the, thing, the thing I would suggest to undergraduates is if you're vaguely interested in maybe pursuing research as a career is to take every possible research opportunity. So this could include things like summer placements. So there are a number of um, funding agencies that will fund uh, summer placements. And, and indeed, like some universities have their own um, summer research placements. I know Cardiff has something called the Cure Up Scheme, which funds a number of students to do a six week project over the summer. And also make every, take every opportunity to do a research project within your degree. So I know sometimes universities offer the option of doing a research project or a um, kind of literature based um, project and I would strongly advise you not to do a literature based re project because it's just not the same as experience the day-to-day -day, um, research and one kind of bigger thing you could do and, it, and, it, and I think is becoming increasingly prominent in people who are applying for PhDs is to consider a professional training year so this is a year in the middle of your undergraduate degree where you go to a lab somewhere or a, an industry or, and work and do research. And if you can get that opportunity within your degree, I would strongly advise you to take it because that will really set you up in good stead, either to decide I don't want to do research or when you come to apply, it'll stand you in really good stead for applying for PhDs. The other thing to do is to learn to code. Um, everybody should learn to code. It, it's, it's invaluable in all types of research going forward, all types of science research. So I know a number of you have asked uh, questions about MSCs and MRESs. And so you could 
one one idea is to go from your undergraduate to do an MSc um, in order to then progress to a PhD. Um, I would this this is this is a perfectly valid option, but I think I would consider it very carefully within the UK at least. There is quite a considerable cost to doing a uh, personal cost to doing an MSc unless you can convert your undergraduate degree to an MSci which is then you basically get uh, you allowed to get student loans but otherwise the, the cost of funding an MS MSc falls on your own shoulders and and really whether they stand you in better stead um, depends on the timing so if you are planning to go from an undergraduate degree to an MSc and then do a PhD you have to be aware that PhDs are advertised in October. So let's say you finish your degree, your undergraduate degree in the July, and then you've, you're on, you've got a place to do an MSc in October. You start your MSc, but it, almost immediately you're being asked to apply for a PhD. And you won't have experienced the MSc, you won't have got the MSc, and you won't have experienced the research project within the MSc. And so it doesn't really have it's very difficult because it doesn't have that much bearing on your ability to do a, a research project when in terms of um, shortlisting applicants. Of course, if you've done an MSc and you've taken time out after the MSc and you have that MSc, then that, that, that does stand you in good stead. But I would just consider the timing if this is your career option, going from an undergraduate to an MSc to a PhD. Going back to what I said earlier, a far better option is to do a professional training year in a research lab during the course of your undergraduate degree, because that's looks that's a whole year of doing research and it stands you in really good stead because it shows that you've committed to doing um, research projects and you've experienced the highs and lows that are associated with that. And it gives you something to talk about. So when applying for PhDs, one thing I would say is that if you're interested in moving into neuroscience, it, it really is a very broad church. And so it doesn't really, I don't think it really matters what your undergraduate degree is to a certain extent as long as it has um, science or mathematical basis. Um, I'm sure there are a number of neuroscience programs that would take individuals because there was often training uh, within that. And similarly, when looking for a neuroscience type PhD, don't necessarily just look for neuroscience programs. You know, there are a number of genetics programs that may be investigating aspects of mental health. There may be um, social sciences and science programs that also have aspects of neuroscience and mental health involved them. So look for neuroscience type PhDs, look broadly when you're, when you're researching what type of project you might want to do. And the other thing I want to talk about is DTP or single project funding. So most um, PhD programs now are moving to what's called a DTP, a doctoral training program, rather than the single projects that used to be advertised when I was um, applying for PhDs. And this, in this situation, you're applying for a program in which there is embedded a, a project and that you're interested in. And I would suggest that if you are applying for, if you've got the choice between a DTP or a single project, so a project that's just one one-off project funding for an individual, I would opt for the DTP where possible. There's much more of a cohort feel, you've got much more support. And if you do go for that single project fund, funding, then I suggest that you ask the supervisor whether there is any, any possibility of aligning with a local DTP, because it just gives you a bit more support. And when applying for PhD projects, think if you think a bit further forward, think about what skills and experience do you want to gain? What's, what kind of skills do you want? Do you want to kind of develop data handling skills? Do you want to do in vivo research? What kind of things do you want to gain? And so then take that into account when looking for when looking for what projects to apply to. During your PhD, particularly if you're in a, within a DTP, take every opportunity to get as many new skills as you can, even if they're not directly relevant to your PhD. PhDs have changed considerably since when I did mine, when it was three years worth of funding and I just worked on the project for three years. Now they're often three and a half to four years worth of funding and there's an, a large component of which is, is in aimed at getting individual skills, whether it be coding skills or data handling skills or statistics skills or computer science skills. And it's even if it's not directly relevant to your to your PhD, get those skills whilst you can and you have that opportunity and network. And also 
take internship opportunities. Certainly there are within the, these DTPs, there is often the opportunities to do three month placements at certain institutes that are separate from your um, PhD, or there is the ability to apply for funding from funding bodies in the UK, like the MRC to do internships. And then you can get an opportunity to look at other things away from the research, uh, things like um, policy making and um, kind of grant funding and things like that. And that, that's always, that's a great opportunity just to broaden your horizons and get new skills and a new outlook on how to, how to maybe progress your own research career. And so of course, then you may move on to postdoctoral research or fellowships, but a PhD doesn't just um, give you the skills for an academic career. It gives you a skills for a whole range of different career areas. And I'm not going to talk about these in, in massive detail, but I thought I'd just look at, I just went through the history of my PhD students over the last 20 years and where they've ended up and count, toss up the numbers. And what I've found is that four have gone into, um, carried on into research. So I've done a postdoctoral research fellowship and stayed in research. Although one of those is hoping to join NASA and become an astronaut. And uh, she, she will, I'm pretty sure of that. She was very, very uh, determined. But others have gone and joined healthcare, so we've gone to do work in the NHS or training, further training in the NHS. One has joined, gone to scientific publishing, one has gone to scientific administration, working for NC3Rs, and uh, one is in a biotech commercial position, so selling um, biotech products, and three have gone into research but non-academic science research. So one is in a drug company and two actually are working for the Office of National Statistics. And so of those individuals who did a PhD with me, only a third remain in academic research. And I think that's important to understand that it's a PhD is, is not just about a career in academic research. Obviously, it's the gateway to becoming an academic, but it's about so much more. And the skills that you gain um, are applicable to a whole range of different um, different aspects of, re of careers. Finally, just some thoughts and suggestions. As I've mentioned before, you know, say yes to any opportunity you get and get involved in those opportunities. Talk to people, talk to other students and see what they've done and how they got there. Really importantly, think about the skills you need and things the, the skills you would like to get as you go through that career and at any stage during your PhD and beyond. Um, as I mentioned, PhDs are tough, but they can be can be good fun. But they are, of course, the gateway to becoming professors. But most PhDs don't become professors. Most students who have a PhD don't become professors. And it's clear it's important to be to realize that and think about the other options that it opens up. Um, as I hope my career is illustrated, all jobs and careers have highs and lows and pros and cons. And don't be afraid to change direction. And certainly one thing that I've heard people being, you know, after their PhD, if they don't stay in academic research, there used to be this feeling that you'd failed. You'd done this, why have you done this degree in research and then not become a researcher? But I think that is absolutely not a failure. It's, it's a, a process in learning some skills that you can apply to a whole range of settings. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Anthony. We have a few questions that are directed to you, but just bearing in mind some time, I think we can pass yeah. straight to Anne yeah. and then we'll have the Q&A session and we can address some of those questions directly to you. So we will be hearing from Dr. Anne Cook, BNA Chief Executive, who studied physiology and neuroscience at university, carried out research into neuronal communication before then following a career path in roles in academia and industry, and now Chief Executive at the BNA. Anne will describe her own career in neuroscience, as well as some of the many other options open to you after a neuroscience degree. So I'd like to pass over to Dr. Anne Cook. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, so let me just bring up my slides here. So you will notice a very similar layout to my, between my slides and Anthony's. Um, I hope you'll be helpful. I will. I've seen there's loads of questions in the Q&A, so I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible so we can get time for your questions. So um, I am here, I guess, as the other career, so the careers beyond academia. As Emma said, I started in neuroscience. I'm still in neuroscience, but I'm no longer an academic researcher. 
So I've got the same kind of outline as Anthony's talk, given an example of a career path beyond academia, which is my own. I'm then going to describe the wide range of careers that are outside academia, and then finish off with some thoughts, tips, and suggestions. Um, now, as attendees here, uh, you will have had the opportunity to to submit questions as part of the registration process. And thank you for submitting those, really helpful to see what people are interested in. Hopefully Anthony's talk and my own talk has addressed quite a lot of those, but I know we haven't covered all of them. So I'm going to actually run a poll now and I'd like you to uh, select which question you'd like me to try and address at the end. So like a mystery question as it were. Um, so I've just put the questions up now and I shall add that to the end of my talk um, as a kind of um, extra question. So my own career path, um, I did A-levels at school, biology, chemistry, maths, and also art. I then, before going to university, I actually uh, spent time as a medical lab assistant in the local hospital. So that wasn't a research lab, that was more diagnostics and testing. I then went on to an undergraduate degree, which was at Cambridge. It was a natural sciences degree but I then specialised in physiology and neurophysiology. So I didn't know at that when I started that I was interested in neuroscience, it was only towards the end. I went on to a PhD at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology and a short postdoc also at the LMB. I then took my first step out of the lab, still in academia, it was at the University of Bristol, um, but the job wasn't doing research at that point, it was to set up an organisation called Bristol Neuroscience with a job title Research Facilitator and Communications Manager. I was there for about 10 years. Uh, through that time, I also did some other things along the way, including being editor for the BNA Bulletin, and I was Research Development Associate at the Bristol Heart Institute. I then took a step outside of academia. So I worked as association manager for the British Anesthetic and Respiratory Equipment Manufacturers Association, long name. Um, so this was in the commercial sector. So Barima is an association of companies, of med tech companies. So it gave me, gave me some insight into commercial sector and med tech in general. And then finally, I've got the job that I have now, which is the chief executive of the BNA. So like Anthony, uh, this is the version that you would see on LinkedIn. Behind the scenes, it's not quite the same. Um, so when I was at school, I failed to get on a summer science program. Seems insignificant now, but at the time I thought that was it. I thought my career in science was over. It wasn't, I did get into university. I got a first in part one, but then I only got a two one in my finals. Again, I thought that's it, I'm not gonna get anything. I did, I got a PhD position and then I managed to lose, accidentally lose my first six months of data, completely lost. I need an extension to finish my thesis. It might've even been two extensions, I can't actually remember. I then didn't really know what to do. Um, I did panic a bit. Um, so there definitely wasn't a kind of career plan. I took the job at Bristol. Um, unfortunately, I did have quite long periods of sick leave during this time, including about a year in hospital. Uh, and then later I was made redundant, um, which you definitely don't see on the LinkedIn version. Uh, I panicked again about what I was doing. And to be honest, I still haven't got um, a career plan. I think that's something I've learned to embrace and to look for opportunities. And I think that's not uncommon is that people often don't really know what they're heading into. Um, I'd like to reassure you. So you don't feel that you do need to know your next 10, 20, 30 years. So some things that I do in this role I have outside of academia, um, a whole range of stuff. So I just kind of brainstorm, brain dump a list of things that I do in my role now. You can see that it kind of covers all sorts of stuff. I'm not going to go through them all in detail. Things I really enjoy about it. I really enjoy working with the people I work with, that I'm still like interacting with scientists. And I really enjoy that I'm still interacting with the science as well, even though I'm not doing science myself. I love the variety and interest it works. And I like to think that the BNA is making a difference and that I can be part of that making a difference. I like the creativity, um, coming up with ideas, even straightforward things, maybe going back to art A level and coming up with designs. And I like the flexibility that it offers. Um, I haven't got to clock in at nine and go home by five. Things I don't enjoy quite so much. It is financially precarious. So, Ironically, one of the reasons I wasn't sure I wanted to stay in academic research was the short term contracts. I'm still on a short term contract. Uh, we still have to apply for funding. So it hasn't really taken me away from that. 
ironically for a position of responsibility. I don't particularly like responsibility. Uh, I get anxious because I am responsible for other people. And also like Anthony, they're never leaving the office. Um, you do, you know, put in more hours and don't forget about it when you go home. I would, however, say that I think that is the flip side of having a job and career that you're interested in and that you enjoy. I have had jobs where it's nine till five and I would not like to go back to that. It was just kind of clock watching and really not interested in it. But you have to decide what's going to work for you. So that's one example of a career outside of academia. Of course, there are lots of others. I'm going to start by doing a quick plug for science administration or research management, because that's the sector that I've kind of ended up in by accident. I didn't know that it existed. Nobody ever talked about it. Um, but a definition here on screen is activities which enable and add value to research, but which do not form part of the research process itself. For me, it was what I was looking for without realizing it. it was a way to stay in science, to contribute to science without actually doing the science research itself. Um, you can be in this sector across all sorts of different organizations, universities, commercial research organizations, charities, funders. You might not see it up front, but actually there are lots of people in this sector of research management or science administration. And the types of roles that could entail, these are roles that I've just taken off organizations' websites. And you can see the range that they cover. You've got like head of membership, publishing director, head of public affairs, head of engagement. So there are lots of roles for people who, if you speak to them, they often will have come from a science background, if it's a science organization, and then have gone in different directions. So outside of science administration, an obvious one is the commercial sector or industry. And there are, again, numerous roles within that sector. Perhaps the most obvious is scientific research, so carrying on being a researcher, but within industry. There's also things like marketing and sales, management, many other roles, communications, business development, and so on and so forth. Legal. So quite a few people after a, a science degree or PhD might go into intellectual property or be a patent attorney. Healthcare professional. So a clinician or specifically in context of neuroscience, you might want to be a psychologist or a neuropsychiatrist. Clinical trials professionals. So clinical trials actually has a whole career pathway itself. Again, um, often people with a science degree or PhD, then going into uh, the CTA training, clinical trials um, assistant or clinical trials associate. People who run clinical trials, really important. Again, you might not have even thought of that. Scientific publishing, so working for a publisher such as scientific journals or books or other types of publications, or doing writing yourself if you enjoy writing. It could be um, like the popular press, the public press, being a science journalist. There are quite a lot of agencies out there, medical writing agencies, where they're providing, providing copy and text for companies, for pharma companies, for other types of companies, interpreting science and making it available to a wider readership. Science policy or public affairs or campaigns, so things that affect science, how science is done, maybe equity, diversity and inclusion, or in the UK, you know, Brexit issues, um, many, many things that come under science policy. Public engagement or PPI, um, so getting public and um, people with lived experience really integrated into the research process. As I've already mentioned, roles in charity or fund or professional society, which would come under this science administration kind of bracket or numerous other things. I think if you are in science, if you're doing a science degree, PhD, you probably have more transferable skills than you actually realize. So pretty much any walk of life that you want to go into, I'm sure you will apply those skills. So some thoughts, tips and suggestions. First of all, just general advice, don't panic. Take your reassurance that lots of people will also be wondering what to do and how to do it and take some reassurance from both Anthony and my stories that it's not quite as clear cut as it might look from LinkedIn. Explore, you know, look around, see what options are out there, really think about what you want to do. Talk to people about what they do. Um, obviously don't harass them, um, but generally speaking, people like talking about themselves. So if you're interested, then ask them, ask them how they got into it, what do they enjoy about it, et cetera, and so forth. Keep in mind that all jobs and careers do have highs and lows or pros and cons. 
So try not to make a decision which is based on, you know, the grass being greener. Um, there are inevitably going to be aspects of what you're doing that you don't like. Try and think about what you do want to do rather than what you want to escape from. It's really helpful to have a mentor. It doesn't have to be somebody at work, it can be outside of work, just somebody you can bounce ideas off, someone you trust, somebody who's probably got a bit more um, experience, a bit older than you, uh, that you can just kind of talk things through with and really focus on what makes you a happy and functional human being. We're all different. Try and identify what you would like out of your career. A bit more specifically, if you're really thinking about, you know, taking next steps into a, a non-academic research career, whilst you're at any stage, preschool, university, undergraduate, postgraduate, postdoc, seek opportunities to get involved in other activities, um, whether that's a public engagement event, uh, maybe doing talks, maybe some charity volunteer work, or even think about, you know, applying and having, don't waste people's time, but even a job interview is really valuable experience. You will learn from anything that you are involved with. So if you have an opportunity, if you can, I would encourage you to say yes. Take time to sit down, old fashioned piece of paper and pen and write a list of what you like, what transferable skills you have, think about what you enjoy in what you're doing. Is it managing teams, running projects? Do you like the fine details or the bigger picture? That will really help you to understand which direction you want to go in. Networking is incredibly important. Again, whatever direction you go in. Don't think of networking as just um, going for the more senior people, the professors and so on. Your peers are incredibly valuable. Your peer-to-peer -peer networking, just you know, people you probably just think of as friends, they will undoubtedly go on in different directions, different careers. They're people that you can pick up the phone, have a chat to, and in years to come, you know, might be a really valuable connection. So really, you know, connect as much as possible. Talk to reps. I mean, it's a bit different now in times of coronavirus, but if you've got um, a rep in your university, uh, instead of just grabbing the free pen, ask them how they got their job, what background they have. And a plug for LinkedIn. I know LinkedIn isn't used very much by academics. Um, it is used very much outside of academia. Get yourself a LinkedIn profile, um, start connecting with other people. I get quite a lot of requests to connect on LinkedIn and I would say that the more personal ones I'm much more likely to accept. So, you know, like today, for instance, I went to your talk, it was really valuable. It would be great to connect. I'm much more likely to say yes to that than, than just a random connection. If you're ready to apply, have a non-academic CV and be specific. So academic CVs are notorious and being pages long. Everything that you did from your primary science school project, cut all of that out. Try and think of it as being on one side, possibly two. Be really specific and make it tailored to what you're applying for. Um, you're looking for particular jobs, then just look around companies, search their websites. You can give them a ring, see if they've got opportunities. Look for job listings. There are you know, things that you might have come across like Indeed, LinkedIn jobs or Read, but there are also recruitment agencies specifically for science or science related jobs, some of which are on the screen here. So Flowtech Engineering, Kinetica, Adzuna, Parexel. There are lots of them, Google. And don't be afraid of short term roles. Um, although ultimately you, you may want to get a, you know, a permanent contract, they can be a really great way to get a foot in the door, something like maternity cover. Um, it's only short, but your experience will, you know, quadruple during that time. So mystery question, I'm going to end the polling now um, and we will see what we've got. So you should be able to see the results here. See the highest by a nudge is what determines the choice between an academic career and one in the commercial sector. So thank you for filling that in. Um, I would reflect on what I've just said really, is that um, there are pros and cons both sides. I think Anthony has described some of the independence that he has. Um, that's definitely not so much the case if you're working for a commercial company. Research projects can be stopped at any point. Um, so, you know, bear in mind the pros and cons, talk to people who are in industry. And really, again, sit down with a piece of paper, think what you like, and then look at the jobs and, and what they can give to you um, and see what will make you the happiest person. Because I think if you're happiest, you'll do the best. So that, that's my advice. Um, I'm sure I've finished my time. I can see other people on the screen. So I'm going to stop sharing now and join my panellists. 
Thank you very much. And there's been some wonderful feedback in the chat. Uh, so I thank the speakers for such encouraging talks. Everyone has really found it really, really valuable. So to touch on questions, we have received many questions, but to be mindful of time, I'm going to cherry pick a few. So um, one addressing Professor Anthony's talk, what does a fellowship entail? Is this a requirement to progress on the academic route to professorship? Um, it's not a requirement, but it is something that would stand you in good stead. It basically involves you obtaining money to set up your kind of in independent research project, often embedded within a, a group, um, but not kind of directly related to to their something that their the line manager is running. So it's your own. You manage the project. You may have your own little postdoc and things like that. So yeah, it's not the be all and end all, but it is. It is a really good thing to show independence. Brilliant. And just to keep you on the screen, uh, many people would like to know which language you would suggest learning to code in, seeing as you mentioned that in your talk. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, really. Um, any any language at all, I think, because it just sets you up in good and stead to be able to apply, learn other languages. So, I mean, certainly R for statistics, um, Python. I know some of the uh, uh, some of the um, uh MATLAB as well. Some of the imaging people use MATLAB, but I think I think it's just any any coding language would show willing, basically, and I think and shows that you can do it, and then you could go off and learn others. Brilliant. Um, this one is saying that is it worth having a LinkedIn even if you want to stay in academia? Anne, I feel like you have some words to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, I would encourage you to have LinkedIn anyway. Um, for me, people like me, it's really helpful when academics have a LinkedIn profile. Um, and I, I do see, especially with online meetings, actually, quite often the online meetings will connect with your LinkedIn profile or have the option of it, which means that you don't have to fill in information time and time again. Um, I think it, I mean, what's, what's to lose? It would spend you probably 20 minutes putting up a LinkedIn profile, find out, give it a go. Um, if you don't find it useful or it's just time wasting, then you can always leave it. But it's been really useful for me. That's brilliant. This question resonates a bit. They say that as an undergraduate, they feel hesitant about trying to find job opportunities during their degree because they feel like they wouldn't be able to juggle and keep up with their studies if there were other responsibilities. So they are asking if they think it's best to leave opportunities until summer because you have advised to sort of grasp opportunities as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can comment on that. Um, I mean, personally, I think probably the most important thing is that you focus on your degree and your mental health. <laughs> um, so for some people, keeping good mental health means having a balance between your degree work and doing other activities like perhaps a job. For others, it's going to be better to focus on the job. Um, so during term time, I would keep those two, for, you know, at the forefront of your mind. Some people I know have to work for financial reasons. If you don't have a financial imperative, I personally would encourage you to think about summer jobs, summer placements, just because then it gives you, you know, more time to think about each separate thing. I don't know if Anthony, you can comment on that. Yeah, I would I would say I would say the same. Obviously you want to focus on on your mental health and your degree during in the course of your degree and, and but it's it's often for research positions, research uh, opportunities. They are in the summer anyway. They're over the they're, they're often summer placements, and uh, they're usually reasonably well funded as well. So it's kind of an alternative to just getting an, uh, another job. But any any experience you could do, you could maybe even volunteer if you if you can't get onto a summer placement, a funded summer placement, you could just see if they could do experience in a lab for for a week. It's it, it's no harm in asking. The worst that anybody could say is no, I haven't got the time. So yeah. Very true. Speaking of lab projects, um, many people said in light of COVID, um, this year sort of prevented them from getting any physical research, any experience in physical research. And some are asking, can you mitigate it only by doing another year of lab training or should they take a master's? So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's absolutely true. And it has been difficult for a lot of people, particularly people doing master's students or, or undergraduate projects. Um, but I would say that not to think of it in terms, I mean, even if you're interested in, in wet lab projects, what we call wet lab projects, I would say that there's always going to be an element of data science. So if you're 
project, the undergraduate project has involved some kind of data analysis, even if you've not been in the lab, that is really good, valuable um, experience and it's, it forms the part of a normal research project anyway. And so I wouldn't think of it as, as anything less less worthy than, than a research project in a lab. It's still, it's, it's, it's something that a lot of re neuroscientist researchers do anyway as part of their training. So it still should be valuable. Wonderful. In connection to your talk, you mentioned imposter syndrome. A few people would like to ask, how are they supposed to really overcome imposter syndrome when, for context, the person who asked the question is an undergrad and they feel like their sort of knowledge and skills is inadequate when they have to come up with possible ideas or projects on their own. And that imposter syndrome can really set in. So yeah. you mentioned you feel it. Yeah, yeah, I don't think you ever really, I think that you don't ever get over it yourself. I think as an undergraduate, you shouldn't really be expected to be thinking of projects on your own. I, I, I wouldn't say, I think you, it's something you would do in discussion with a supervisor, you know, and that's part of the training process. And, and it's part of the training process in a PhD. You shouldn't be expected to come up with the project on your own. It's, a, it's a, an iterative process with your supervisor. But in terms of trying to get over imposter syndrome, I think it's kind of, beholden on everybody to kind of just uh, be nice to, to people and remind them of when they've done something good you know so I you know I remember having a one of my PhD students coming back and saying to me I remember saying to her that I was thinking of, of leaving science or whatever and she said well but, but you know international renowned researcher and you kind of you need people to kind of reiterate that occasionally so I think it's beholden on us to be um, to remind people of how the good things that they've done and how good they are sometimes basically. Yeah, if I could just add to that, I think totally what Anthony says, I don't think it's something that you you kind of leave behind. It's not specific to being an undergraduate. Um, I would also remind, you know, what I said about having a mentor it doesn't have to be someone at work, just someone in your life that you can go to with those concerns and you can get some, you know, truthful feedback, which is often like, no, you're doing fine. You know, look at what you've done, look at what you've achieved. Um, so I think it's really important to have somebody in your life who can do that, who can provide that. And remember that, you know, pretty much everybody has imposter syndrome. So try not to feel too isolated in that. Yeah, that's excellent advice. So here somebody is asking that they would like to pursue a PhD in the future, but is currently looking for a job. So what sort of recommendations would you have to for them to sort of have a job that will supplement their PhD application? So would it be a research assistant in academia, something in industry. What are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, I mean, if you can get onto it, I mean, that, if you get onto a research assistant position, um, doing a research job, that's that's absolutely brilliant experience, but they are quite few and far between. So I think any, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I just need to work for a while, I don't know whether it's just for financial reasons or whatever, then I think it, that's fine. But I think it's just to maintain an interest in neuroscience if that's the area you want to go in, you know, become become a member of the BNA. You can become an associate member, and 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 I would and and maintain that kind of link with the neuroscience community whilst you kind of decide what PhD you want to do. I don't think it will be held against you. Um, it's just uh, if if you're not doing a research related job, if you can, it's obviously better. But it, it certainly wouldn't be the, the held against you. Um, and and many people have come from other jobs and re-entered academic um, life uh, later on. Yeah, I've certainly, um, I, I don't, I mean, maybe Anthony's got different views, but I know people, supervisors, um, researchers who've had mature students, students who haven't come straight from a university degree, and generally they really welcome them. They like people with a bit more life experience and ability to manage their time. So even if you haven't had a job which is directly doing research, illustrate that you can manage a project. Um, or, you know, deliver things on time, work in a team. I think they're all valuable things to take into a PhD with you. Brilliant. And to answer a question for some of our younger students, um, they're not yet studying in university or anything like that, but they know that they'd want to go somewhere, let's say molecular or cognitive neuroscience, they've thought that far, but they don't know where to start in terms of getting experience or to supplement their university application in a way that shows that they're very interested in the field. So do you have any ideas for how they could get any form of experience? 
Um, I mean, the best thing is to just write to people who are re if you if you're if you if you're keen that you know neuroscience and you want to get into an area. Let's say you want to look at neuroimaging. Write to researchers in university who are doing neuroimaging and asking ask if they can have. Um, you can go for a week to do some work experience. Um, and I've certainly hosted quite a number of students, many of which have actually gone on to neuroscience degrees who after their, uh, in, in the course of their A-levels, they've, they've come to me and, and just done a, work, a week where we've shown them different things. And, you know, the worst people can do is say, no, I haven't got the time, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's not, so if you, that's not the end of the world. So, um, and, but the best they could do is say, yeah, you can come for a week this, uh, this time in, in June or whatever and, 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 and have some experience. Exactly. Yeah, it's literally just getting your foot in the door, isn't it? The worst somebody can say is no. So yeah. um, another question is that you've mentioned the mindset of not leaving the office, that you always have something on your mind. You're always thinking of something ahead. This person asks if you think this is inherent to sort of academia and academia related jobs, or do you think this is a mindset that can be avoided? Uh, yeah, so I think it, I think it probably can be avoided. I think um, I think it's just I think it depends on on and it's not all the time. It's kind of if you're interested, if you've got something, a project, maybe I'm writing a grant, then I'll be thinking about it a lot because it's a, it's a big chunk of my work. Um, and I think I think it probably it probably could be inherent, slightly more inherent to academic research. But I don't think it's I don't think all academics have this problem because um, I just I just think it occurs occasionally. So it's not. Yeah. I don't know if that really answers the question. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to... What gonna, do you think? Yeah, dive in on that one as well. Um, I don't think it's black and white. I don't think it's something that's specific to academia and not outside of academia. I would say, personally, I think having some experience sort of outside of academia and knowing people who work outside, there's plenty of people who work out academia and definitely take the, the job home with them. Um, it's what makes you function best. Some people are very compartmentalized, other people not so much. Having had, I said, having had jobs, mostly student jobs, you know, working in dog kennels or factories or, um, that's got a real downside that basically you're not really interested in it, you're not invested in it. Whereas I have a job now that I really care about. And I think if you have the type of job that you care about, it's kind of inevitable that you're going to be thinking about it outside of office hours and certainly people you care about I really enjoy the people I work with that I work with and I carry on caring for them outside of the office um, so obviously you want to get a balance you don't want to end up you know having a um, you know, not having anything in your life it's about getting things outside of work too but I do think there's a bit of a flip side if you want a job that you're interested in you care about you're not going to go nine till five um, and then just switch off completely um, if you want a nine to five job, then that's totally fine too, but it's just a different type of job. That's fair enough, yeah. Um, here we have some questions about continuing their studies in neuroscience when they've come from a different field. So they're saying that it's very difficult for somebody who's been, um, let's say studying philosophy and they've achieved, they've done their master's degree, but they'd want to then go forth and study neuroscience. Do you have any sort of general advice for a person in this situation? Yeah, so we've had uh, we've had on our PhD, one of our PhD schemes, we've had a philosophy student who'd done philosophy and uh, came and did neuroscience directly, applied for a neuroscience PhD. I think if you, um, if you obviously one way of, of moving into a field is to do a, a master's degree and, and you know I don't want to be too dismissive of masters but that's what I was trying to say I was thinking about the timing of applications for masters they are perfectly valid in terms of getting a basis for neuroscience so that would be an option but it's not impossible to apply directly from a de degree that's outside of the sciences as long as you can demonstrate that you do have an understanding and an interest in the field and understand um, the kind of limitations that you will experience, you know, and the, and, the, and the effort that you'll have to put in to get up to speed. But, you know, it's nobody comes into a PhD having the skills to do the PhD. They learn the skills as they go through the PhD. So, yeah, I think it's I think that I think it's not impossible, but an MSc in neuroscience might be a good way of, 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 of getting that basis if you're worried about that. Mm. Yeah, I also happen to know someone who did philosophy as an undergraduate degree, was interested in neuroscience. Um, they had, I think, a year or or even two 
between that and starting their PhD. And during that time, um, they went to talks, they read up, they got in contact with neuroscience, they talked about it. They were able to arrange some kind of work experience shadowing in a local university. Um, and they got a PhD place. So it's definitely not impossible. Like Anthony says, a lot of what you do for a PhD, you will learn at the PhD. Um, in terms of getting experience, I know this has come up in uh, several times in different contexts. We have got some information on the BNA website under the careers section. It's actually labeled, I think, undergraduate summer placements, but the same advice would apply pretty much for anyone wanting to try and get experience. Um, so yeah, just get out there and ask around. <laughs> So do you think that would link to um, somebody is asking if they're not doing a master's or a PhD, they've just graduated um, BSc um, undergrad neuroscience and they're thinking just to go straight into a career. They're not thinking of doing any other postgrad opportunities, but they're thinking what are the opportunities available to them? So would that link, you think, to the information on the BNA site? Um, that would link to information, yes, it's certainly about getting experience. Um, if they're not interested in going into postgraduate study, um, they might be interested in, there's a website called Technicians Make It Happen. Another career path that we haven't actually talked about is that a lot of research is carried out by technicians. Again, maybe we don't realize it. Um, if you've got an undergraduate degree, then that's a fantastic way to do research without going into postgraduate education. Um, and if you're looking for a job outside of research, I would look at job ads and what they require. Um, you know, some of them will specify a postgrad degree, but a lot of them don't. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely options for you without having to do postgraduate study. Thank you, Anne. Uh, on the flip side of that, um, I feel like um, Professor Anthony would be able to answer. This person is asking, how do they know which PhD lab is best for them? And how would they arrange for funds? It's a loaded question. <laughs> so most um, so most PhD um, programs are funded. So um, I wouldn't be applying. I would, you know, and, and often individuals will advertise their projects within a funded position. And I think people have self-funded or uh, obtain their own funding. But I would say on the whole, you know, PhDs that are advertised are fully funded, both in terms of um, the stipend and, and fees and also some, some money for, for training and things like that. And in terms of which PhD to do, where, which supervisor, the, the key thing is to go and speak to the supervisors, to speak to them about the project, um, to speak to individuals who are working in the lab or working in that institute when you, either at interview or beforehand. Uh, and, and just speak, again, it's just talking to people about their experience will give you an impression as to whether that supervisor is a good supervisor or a less good supervisor. And, and then you can make a decision with a little bit of information, basically. And just off the back of that, um, a very good question. If there is only one thing that you look for in a PhD application, what would it be? Ah, that is a good question. I would say an understanding of how um, science works. So the, an understanding of the idea that you ask a question, you go away and test that question, and then you um, just you, know, you describe your, your interpretation and limitations of that question. So that could be from your undergraduate project. You know, even if your undergraduate project has not worked very well, then there probably was a question at the start of that undergraduate project, and you to talk about how you try to address that that question and whether and whether that answers the question or not, I think that that fundamental thing is what when we're training PhD students is what we're trying to get them to understand is the process of science, not necessarily just doing the science. It's the asking a question: How do I go about answering that question? Have I answered it completely, or are there alternative interpretations? So that's that's what I would say. Thank you so much. I think that we'll have to leave it there because it is now 10 past 12. Thank you all very much for attending and for all of your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer every single one of them, but we could direct you to some interesting resources that I know um, have been put in the chat that Anne and Anthony have mentioned. So again, thank you all very much. I hope this talk has been very useful to you all. Thank you to our speakers. And this talk, once again, has been recorded, so you'll be able to go back and find any information once it has been put on the BNA YouTube channel. Are there any messages, uh, Dr. Ran and Professor Anthony, you'd like to say your final goodbyes? Uh, just um, keep, keep trying, keep talking to people, and 
I think um, neuroscience is a very broad church and, you know, it's, it, there's lots of things you can do within neuroscience and with a neuroscience PhD. Yeah, I, I can't not go without giving a plug for BNA membership. Sorry, it's part of the job description. But seriously, if you're interested in neuroscience, stay in touch with the neuroscience community. Lots of opportunities. Um, like Anthony said, loads of um, kind of directions you can go to with neuroscience. I did not know I was interested in neuroscience when I started my degree. Um, and I, I love it. I still love it now. I think it's fascinating. And it's a wonderful bunch of people. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to meeting some of you further down the line in your careers in neuroscience. Of course, thank you all so much for your questions, for your engagement, for your wonderful feedback. It has been a wonderful careers in neuroscience and beyond webinar. And yes, we hope to see you somewhere down the line. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Emma. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.